So we will now move to our uh, next segment of our, our program. This afternoon it's my pleasure to introduce our lunch keynote speaker today. Um, his name is Dr. Spencer Suhu. Uh, Dr. Suhu is the, um, he, was a he was a couple roles actually at uh, Cedar sinai House Systems. He's the Chief Information Security Officer along with the Director of Scientific Computing. Uh, Dr. Suhu's presentation today uh, is entitled Information Security Challenges in a Large Academic Medical Center. And um, Dr. Su Hu will, has also has graciously, graciously agreed to be on a, a panel, uh, which is the, the session following this one. So um, we are very grateful for his participation today. A little more, a little more background on, um, on Dr. Su Hu. Uh, he has been with Cedar sinai for over 36 years, uh, starting first as a biomedical engineer then a research scientist in pulmonary medicine before moving into IT to manage a research computing facility at Cedar sinai before it was merged uh, with the enterprise IT organization. Uh, his various roles include managing data networking, security, servers, email, storage, and a data center. Um, he earned a BS in electrical, electrical engineering from the University of Rochester a MS in, in Electrical Engineering from the George Washington University, and MS and PhD degrees in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Southern California. A little more background, uh, he has a heavy research background uh, as well with years of practical experience managing various facets of IT, which gives him a unique perspective in, uh, on security uh, when he interacts with the physicians and research scientists at Cedar sinai to strike a reasonable balance between the natural tendency of scientists and clinical researchers to openly share information and the need to consider regulatory and information security risks. So um, we are very grateful and, and very glad to have uh, Dr. Suhu uh, here with us today and uh, we, we look forward to his keynote presentation uh, this afternoon. So if you please join me and welcome Dr. Spencer Suhu from Cedar sinai Health Systems. Thank you, thank you for having me here today. I feel really old now. Um, so just a little bit of background. So the question I often ask myself is how did I get here? Well, it all started off with a lunch conversation with the, our CIO. And um, I really wasn't looking for a job as a CSO, but you know, that was the furthest thing from my mind. But uh, at the end of the, uh, near the end of the lunch, he said, well, you know, you can't have fun all the time. You have to do some real work and we need a CSO. So that was one of those aha moments. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So uh, just an overview for Cedars. Um, I think we're, uh, we're a fairly large institution. We've been around for a while. And, I just won't go over, I, you know, it services about 3.3 million people, but uh, the main thing on the slide is that um, there's a focus, the mission has for the institution is patient care, education, and what we call translational research. So the, the model there is bedside, or bench to bedside, so whatever you develop in the lab, you try to move it out to the bedside. So that's a big component of the, of the work that goes on at Cedars. So just to give you an idea of how busy we are, you know, service a lot of people, census runs about 750 people a day, so it's, and um, and so um, then there's a focus on research, so um, there are about 800 people involved in research, and a lot of them um, historically are very distrustful of the IT organization and having been on that side where it's like, okay, those folks in IT are just getting in the way of me doing my research. Let me figure out how to work around them. And so that, that lends a unique challenge in, a, in an environment where you're really worried about preserving health, uh, health information and security. So it's also a major training facility. We've got 500 residents and fellows and graduate programs uh, we've got lots of uh, medical students rotating through. They'll come through for a two-week rotation. 
go away for six weeks or six months and then they'll show up again. And so there are some challenges because there's some different governance processes behind how you onboard and offboard them. They're different from employees and different from positions. So that sort of adds to the mix of the challenge. So um, I'm going to start off just by going over a little bit of background on how we're using technology and how the use of technology in healthcare has changed. So you've got your traditional uses where you've got your so-called ADT, which is admission, trans discharge and transfer, billing, payroll, email for office automation, a lot of standalone systems. You've got a standalone system for pathology, standalone system for your imaging, standalone system for pharmacy, uh, different patient billing systems, you name it, they're all standalone systems. And so that's been, the, that's been the, uh, the landscape until about five to seven years ago. And then there was a focus to implement EMRs or electronic medical records or EHRs, electronic health records. And so those have to do with physician ordering. Um, when a doctor places an order right now, the way it's done is the doc used to be, doctor would say, okay, this patient needs test XYZ, give the information to a nurse on the way out to the elevator or to see the next patient, the nurse writes it down and then may you know, make a phone call or go into that particular system, like let's say the doctor wants to order an x-ray. So then the nurse will just con go into the imaging system and place the order there. The x-ray technician shows up, does the x-rays. So with the EMR, it's all online. You, the doctor has to log in, sit down, type out the order, and then they can move on their way. And so that presents some challenges because that's a really different way of workflow for the doctor. A friend of mine who is an OB doctor complained to me, he said, you know how many extra patients I couldn't see today because I had to sit down and log into your system and place the order myself? You know, it's a lot simpler for me just to pick up my phone and on the way out, phone the order in. So that's, that's been a major change in, in, in healthcare, major change in culture too. So there's also scheduling, so now you can do the patient scheduling there. You can, the EMR pulls in labs, medications, you've got remote access, you now have patient portals so patients can look at their own health records. And then, so then that leads to the next uh, logical step which is device integration. So everybody's seen the inside of a hospital room, right? Hopefully not, or some of you. So you, know, you walk into a room, you've got bedside monitors, you've got a nurse call system where you can pick up the, uh, push the little button and the nurse comes to you and they can talk to you over a speakerphone. Uh, you've got, if you're getting medications put in through a pump, you've got this infusion pump. Uh, some beds have a scale built into them where they've got sensors built in so that if you get out of bed, the alarm goes off because you, you might be at risk for fall. And so the idea is that, okay, we've got this electronic medical record, now let's try integrating all that stuff from all these other devices into the EMR so you've got it all in one area. And so that's, that's the next phase. And then the last phase that we're gonna, that, that naturally flows is the analytics side. You know, now you've got metrics on things and that allows you to do things you couldn't ever do before. You can look at how efficient you're delivering healthcare. You know, what the turnaround time is between when you ordered a lab result and when the result actually got put into the system. Uh, when you discharge a patient, what kind of follow-up did you have to make sure that that patient didn't, didn't get readmitted? So that's a really big shift in technology in healthcare. And so, and just as, a, as an indication of how that's changed the landscape in terms of security, we just look at our electronic medical record rollout so as part of that rollout, we deployed hundreds of additional workstations. Uh, I think, you know, the joke was that there were, ten there are three times more workstations than there are beds in the hospital. And, uh, and the reason for that is that you don't want any caregiver, any doctor or nurse to have to stand in line to wait to get to a workstation. You want it right there when, they're, when they need to use it. So towards that, and we've also deployed mobile workstations and carts. Computers and wheels are cows. And so then, the, then that's seeing us evolve to a shift in workstations to mobile, from workstations to mobile devices. And so we have this thing about putting cows out to pasture. Um, but you know, at Cedars, we don't call them cows anymore. We call them wows. Workstations on wheels, 
So the story behind that is that we had a bariatric patient who was going in for surgery, and the nurse yelled out, will the cow in here? And so the, the patient's family got really upset, thought we were referring to the patient. And so, right, <laughs> that went up to our chief nursing officer, and so the, ne the next week, the mandate came out, change the names of those. They're, they're wows now, they're not cows. Pardon? Okay, I'm, I'm glad we're in good company then. <laughs> um, we've also uh, been looking at uh, mobile device technology. So there are a lot of cool things that you can do once you've got the EMR. Uh, one of them is, uh, and also with the technology that's available now, we can do a lot of other a lot of really cool things. So uh, we're looking at the use of mobile device technology for d better delivery of patient care. And so this is a project that I actually started with about six years ago, and then when I moved on, other people picked it up, and I'm just amazed at where it's gone since then. So you start off with, uh, you have your bedside monitors, your arrhythmia monitors, you have telemetry for people who are mobile and walking around. You've got your bedside uh, patient call system, medical devices, uh, infusion pumps. So those, those all generate data. And the idea is that those data feed into a cardiac monitoring center, and there, alerts require intervention. You see an arrhythmia, somebody has to look at it and figure out whether or not it's a false alarm or not. And then they'll generate an alert that goes out to a centralized aggregation point. At the same time, this other stuff goes to a nurse's station, and so some alerts require user intervention, some will just go straight to the alerting system. And then you've got critical lab results, so you all push them into this one hub, and then you push it out to a handheld device. In this case, that handheld device is a, little, is a modified iPhone. It's a modified iPhone that we've deliberately disabled the SIM card on, so you can't use it to make calls, but you can make phone calls over our VoIP, internal VoIP network, and all the texting and messaging stays inside of our network so it's secure. And so now that changes the way you deliver healthcare because instead of having an overhead page go off where you're running around and saying, can you, uh, you know, please see the patient in room 35, uh, they need something, you, you get the alert on your uh, I, modified iPhone, and you say, okay, I've got to go there. And in fact, the story I like to tell is that my son was recently at Cedars for a procedure, and then the, the nurse pulled out her iPhone and said, excuse me, but you know, I'm not texting my boyfriend or anything. This is an alert that I have to respond to. And so, he, so I said, oh, great, you know, I, I understand because I helped put that in a long time ago. So um, <clears throat> another area where it's really, and this is really exciting for me because um, this ties a lot of different technologies and a lot of uh, facets together. So the idea is that uh, medication errors are a major source of what they call SAE, significant adverse events in a hospital, i.e. a near miss or maybe not so near miss. And so the idea is, how do you uh, increase patient safety using the technology? So you start off with step one, you scan the patient's wristband. It's a barcode. It's a wireless scanner. You then go into your WOW or your COW, and you verify that you've got the correct patient. Then you scan the medication, and then that goes onto your EMR. And then you basically look at that, and you verify that make sure that that matches with what the doctor had ordered earlier in the day, and then you say, okay, this is fine, and then the system then pushes it out through, through our internal Wi-Fi network to a wireless infusion pump, and that programs the pump with the right dose, and then you go back in to the WOW and verify that you check the pump, and then you go back into the EMR and you verify that the pump says what the EMR says should be there. And so that's just a great way of making sure you've eliminate a lot of the medication errors that can happen. And again, the whole idea is to do, improve the delivery of care. So then we come to my favorite area, the wild, wild west of research. So these are some of the things that we do, and these are some of the fun things in my job. So we're, we're helping people with, uh, you know, doing a lot of modeling. We've got a 400 plus node high performance computing cluster. Um, and so we've got some people who chew up, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 hours of computer time doing some modeling and simulation. 
a lot of people working in genomics doing a lot of DNA sequencing. So that's on one side, and then we've got a big program in translational research. So we've got people who are doing, you know, let's let's recruit patients for a study or uh, try out these drugs, and we uh, need to collect data from them. And by the way, because it's an NIH-sponsored study, we have to we have to collaborate with other institutions. So we've got to make this a collaborative study with maybe three or four other institutions around the country. So that presents a set of challenges that are quite different from the normal challenge you run into, you know, just for patient care. And the other thing that, that makes things a little wild is that is the funding model. So most places you get your operational budget, you buy your computers, you're paying for maintenance, things like that. Well, in the research, what happens is you get a grant, you use the grant money to buy a computer, buy the computer, you use it, you're generally really going to be really cautious about how you're spending your money, so you're not going to buy maintenance for the computer, but you buy it. Grants over in three years, what's well, perfectly good computer, you still use it, right? Now it's time to upgrade that machine to the next operating system. Well, let's see, there's no money for it, the computer still works, so fine, we're just going to keep using it and not worry about the consequences. And that comes back and bites you. Or the other challenge you have is that, uh, like at Cedars, we've imported, you know, you have researchers who come and go the same way most companies do mergers and acquisitions. So recently we imported an entire stem cell research lab from University of Wisconsin. We recruited the lab director, he brought along his lab techs, his postdocs, other research scientists, his microscopes, and all his computers. So then our desktop folks were, say, were presented with this dilemma. We've got these 500, or I'm sorry, about 100 computers that don't conform to our corporate standards. We can't replace them all. We've got to figure out how to make them work in our environment. And so there are a lot of compromises they have to deal with to make that work. So then that sort of leads to the, uh, the, the question, uh, how secure is healthcare IT? You know, so you've all heard about the target breach, right? And I think you probably had to have been living on a deserted island to not hear about the target breach. But, um, and so that's basically causing, uh, you know, causing a lot of focus, a lot of effort going into securing the retail sector. A lot of effort has already gone on in, in terms of securing the, the financial industries. So now retail is going to get a big focus on securing their systems. And then, uh, so the guys who are after, you know, the bad guys are after, are following the money. So where's the next logical target? Well, it's probably healthcare. And, you know, that's also in light of the uh, FBI report, that, uh, the notice that came out that warned that people, the healthcare is probably especially vulnerable to cyber attacks. And um, so, you know, I think you've all heard that, you know, a successful uh, breach can cost companies millions of dollars, both for, you know, re remediation of the breach, any fines and penalties, lawsuits, and loss of their, uh, loss of their reputation. So, and then in healthcare, you think about it, you've got a medical record, and you've got everything you need for identity theft. You've got the patient history, you probably know who, you probably know who the family members are, age, date of birth, address, social security number. Uh, anything that you need for security, for identity theft is in one location. Now, the, one of the differences is somebody pointed out, if some, my credit card information gets breached, fine. Get a new credit card number, right? So try changing your health information. It's a lot harder. So, uh, and I don't, you know, I haven't real, really been able to find the source, but I've heard the number of $50 per medical record is the going rate on the black market versus, I think it's $5 for a social security number and maybe $1 for a credit card number. So it's, it's a high value target in terms of, um, of uh, attracting people to try and get in, uh, trying to get into uh, get health information. And then there's another dimension that uh, a lot of industries don't have to, f have to contend with. So this year we've had one healthcare provider pay a total of $1.9 million in fines because they had unencrypted laptops containing patient information that were stolen. Uh, in March, uh, in, the county, in the county of Los Angeles, uh, we had a billing agency that was doing um, billing for county facilities, and they had somebody broke into their facility, stole two monitors and eight desktop machines, and so that resulted in a breach of about 168,000 
patient records. So it'll be interesting to see how the fines settle out on that one. And then just recently, earlier this month, uh, New York University and Columbia University uh, run a, jointly run a hospital, New York Presbyterian, and they got hit with a $4.8 million fine because they had a computer that was used for some patient research database, and it wasn't properly scrubbed or cleaned, and so it was, left, it was put out on the internet, and somebody ran a Google search and found his partner's uh, medical information on it, and so that resulted in, you know, I think the $4.8 million is the largest fine so, uh, to date. And then in California, we've got our own set of rules to have to contend with. So, you know, if we have a breach in California, not only do we have to report it to the Office of Civil Rights for the, at the federal level, but the State Department of Health requires us to report it. I, I, I think uh, I'm within one or two days, but I think we have three days to report it after we discover we have a breach. So our chief compliance officer is always calling me up and saying, Spencer, we got to find out what happened here and see if we can't find out who logged in to do what and things like that so we can pull together a report to, re to, to, to let them know. And the report requirements are pretty stringent. If I accidentally fax a prescription to the wrong pharmacy or to, to somebody else, that's reportable. I have to self-report that because that was a breach of information. It went to an un un unauthorized person, somebody who would, had no business seeing that information. So I think our compliance folks do an average of about 30 investigations a, a month. I think one of those, one out of the 30 reports, results in a report that we have to make. So, um, you know, just thinking about it, where are the areas that we have to worry about security challenges? So we've got technical vulnerabilities, we've got vendors and business associates, we've got our workforce, and we've got patients. Those are four broad categories that we have to look at. So let's look at the technology one first. Okay, so as I mentioned with our EMR rollout, we suddenly have 10 times more devices to have to worry about. And then we, not only do we have 10 times more devices, we have three to five different types of devices we have to worry about. So you know, in the issue, in the example with the pump integration, we've got to worry about the workstation security, we've got to worry about the wireless pump, we've got to worry about the handheld devices, uh, and, then, uh, and then the servers that, and the infrastructure that supports all that stuff. And then uh, with the, uh, as I mentioned with the, uh, with the workstation on wheels, that they're, that, uh, that's creating a, a major effort too because uh, you know, there's, there's a push for replacing those workstations with mobile devices. So, but let, let's set that aside for a second. So on the uh, application platform level, though, we, we've run into quite a few challenges because it's not a single application platform for all these services. We're finding that on some of the devices, we don't have uh, anti <clears throat> good antivirus or malware protection. There are weak security controls. There's a long lag in certifying per uh, patches and then operating system upgrades can be a big deal. For example, <clears throat> We still have machines that uh, are running XP. Why? Because the vendor that provides the uh, anatomic pathology software system hasn't gotten around to certifying it for even XP Service Pack 2. <clears throat> so we're saying, okay, so, uh, and then there are other applications which just flat out crash when we try to run them on upgraded platforms. So uh, that can be a really big deal. Um, <clears throat> If you look at some of the, uh, this slide, is, this part shows some of the, uh, I'll call sentinel moments, or I hate to say milestones, but they're, they're uh, inflection points, I guess, in our security p position. So, and this sort of illustrates how, how we, th these incidents illustrate how we, how we arrived at a lot of the security architecture we have. So we start off in 2003 with the Blaster RPC worm. Anybody remember that? Okay, a few, all right. Um, <clears throat> so this was a worm that went around and caused machines to reboot themselves all the time and just propagated like wildfire through the network. And so um, for our 
bed monitoring system, the vendor had just converted over from a proprietary operating system to Windows. So we had hundreds of Windows machines uh, that were providing input from the patient monitoring systems, EKGs, waveforms, and things like that. And the servers that they're on kept rebooting themselves because this RPC worm was, was nailing them. So we said, okay, <clears throat> talk to the vendor, and we said, we gotta apply these patches. The vendor said, you can't. We said, why? Because they avoid the FDA certification of the software. We said, that, well, had some other choice words for that, but. <clears throat> so we said, well, what do we do? They said, well, take the reference CD that you have and reinstall the operating system. Fine. Clinical engineer goes out, reinstalls the operating system, an hour later, guess what? No patches, boom, you're nailed again. So that took a long time to, uh, to sort out. And what we ended up doing in that case is we said, geez, thank goodness we put all these on a separate network. We just yanked the plug between that network and the rest of our campus network and, and then cleaned those machines out. So that actually was a wake-up call for better patch management as well, better antivirus deployment, and also started us down the path to putting internal firewalls which then had their own set of challenges later on, and that came back to bite us. Because uh, how many application vendors will tell you that they've changed the ports that they're using when they upgrade their software? Most people don't, right? So the application, so for the same bed monitoring system, we had it deployed in a brand new critical care tower. I insist that we have fire modules put on every floor to just protect us against something like the blaster worm again. They did an upgrade, and none of the monitoring systems worked. And so the field engineer was going, geez, you know, it's gotta be something with a network. So he said, well, it turns out it was because the application programmers had changed the ports that they used to communicate on, and we were blocking those ports. So our CIO was pretty pissed at me for that one. <clears throat> and his mandate was rip the firewalls out, but then it turned out, fortunately, it turned out to be too much of a hassle to rip the firewalls out so that everybody just sort of left them in place and we sort of worked around it. Every time an upgrade came around, we learned that we'd have to ask the application developers, did you change anything? So in 2009, we had the configure outbreak. And so ultimately, we tracked that down to somebody holding a USB key and they were in a research lab and they were taking the, their thumb drive, going to an instrument they had a PC hooked up to it and downloading the data to it, then taking that thumb drive and loading it onto their desktop to upload the data to their desktop. Turns out that thumb drive was one that they used at home and was infected. So that's how Configure spread throughout our campus. So then as a result of deconstructing what happened, we decided, okay, fine, we're gonna set up, excuse me, more, make better use of isolated networks. We're gonna, Machines that we know we can't upgrade with antivirus software or other things, we're gonna isolate them off and they can only talk to other, to the data center and maybe one other network. We're deploying internal IPS and IDS appliances. We're turning on the firewall in Windows on the workstation level. And we got really tough about insisting on standard images for workstations. Which then goes counter to what we were trying to do in the research area, we'll get into that later. 2009 was also another inflection point, so to speak, in our security posture because we had a laptop that was stolen. So this was a very diligent employee who was going to China and she was trying to finish off a report for our pediatrics folks. So she had a spreadsheet with about 50 patient names and addresses and medical record diagnosis, things like that on it. So she was fishing, finishing it off on her way to the airport. Finished off the report, went to China, left the PC, left the laptop in a cab. So when she reported that uh, her laptop was stolen, we asked her, well, what's on it? Well, nothing except this one spreadsheet. So that was a reportable incident. <clears throat> and fortunately for us, you know, it's below the reporting threshold where we have to call a press conference. But nonetheless, our, court, our chief compliance officer had the unpleasant task of contacting all 50 patients to say, by the way, your information is now someplace in China. And he got some really choice comments on that one. But uh, <clears throat> so that, that's, that made us decide, that, okay, from this point on, we're gonna encrypt every single laptop in the organization. It's gonna be a pain, but we're gonna do it. And so it took about a year to get, to get every laptop encrypted. 
And then, and so then we'd, we'd just say, patting ourselves on the shoulder and saying, okay, we're, we're done with that. And then two weeks after we put it to new computers into a new office, a guy walks in, walks out the door with two of our small form factor Dell computers under his, under his arm and waves at the security camera on his way out. And so we said, oh my God, you know, they had patient schedules on those, lap on those computers. <clears throat> so then we said, fine. Okay, from this point forward, everything is encrypted. End of discussion. So every single desktop, every laptop is encrypted. End of discussion. <clears throat> 2011. Uh, I don't know if anybody re knows what spam ranking, spam ranking .net is. It's, uh, the premise of spam rankings .net is to monitor the sites that are most responsible for spam in the world. And the premise is that uh, a lot of spam comes from compromised machines that, have, you know, affected with malware or whatever, part of a botnet. <clears throat> and so the more spam that comes from a particular IP address or a range of IP addresses, the more lax their security is. So he's, basically, the, this is a research project started by somebody at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, and so he starts publishing these uh, ratings. And the idea is that if we publish the ratings, the p companies that are on it will get embarrassed and do something about it. Well, it worked. CIO calls me up the day that that report came out and says, get me off the list now. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Jim, were you working with us then? No. OK. so. Um, we did a lot of research. You know, how the hell did we get on this list? So it turned out that uh, a lot of, we have a lot of smart people who do stupid things when they get phishing messages. So you get a phishing, you get an email from the IT help desk. Never mind if you look at the email address, the IT help desk is really joestowingservice.com. Joe at joestowingservice.com, right? And then the, con the text of the message is, your account has been locked because you're overquoted. Click here to fix the problem. So you click here. Hi, I need your username and password. Bam. You know, that's it. You've comp you're compromised. So these smart people don't look at the fact that the URL they're pointing to is maybe sadiesyoga.com, not Cedar Sinai. <clears throat> And I think part of that, I think, has to do with you're, you're getting the stuff on your mobile device and you really don't read all that stuff. You're just zooming in on the, uh, the text that shows up on the screen. So anyways, uh, we did four things there. We said, OK, fine. We need to put out a big anti-phishing awareness campaign. So it's a pervasive thing where you know, we're reinforcing the message every time we can. Uh, like this morning, we just got one that was targeted to Cedars. So I went to our CEO who forwarded it to me and basically said, uh, this from Cedar Sinai Medical Center, was, that was the subject, something about attention needed, and then there was a link that says, you know, your email account is thinking it's being locked out, please click here to, to fix the problem. So, you know, we'd gotten enough visibility in this, our, our CEO forwarded it to me. So then our email team immediately went to work. They said, oh, well, this message got sent to 200 users. We contacted them and say, hey, you know, we've blocked the link at the firewall, but delete the message, and we also use that as a way of reinforcing the message. And then we also looked and said, okay, we've got to figure out how machines get, get nailed by malware. A lot of the times the stuff comes in, it's not detected by any antivirus software. So we actually got some technology in place that will let us detect machines that are in the process of phoning home. You know, they get infected, they're trying to phone home, and so we can cut that off at the firewall. And along with that, we have better monitoring and we have more frequent security scans. And so then the latest one, Heartbleed, uh, there are some take-home lessons there. So it told us we had the better inventory than we have. We thought we had a good inventory, but it turns out not. And then the first time we did scanning, we all came up with, oh, well, there are only 23 machines that we have to worry about. Then somebody challenged that, so we took a second look and said, oh my god, you know, our scanning technology, our scanning methodology needs to be fixed because we can cover 10 times more. So those are some of the, uh, the points on the technology side that, uh, that sort of led us to our current security posture, or security configuration. Then the other uh, aspect is our workforce. So somebody asked me, uh, 
what keeps you up at night? What are the top things that keeps you up at night? So number five on the list is what happens at home then stay at home. So there's my USB stick story. You know, the researcher who had the USB key at home and brought it into work. And so then, uh, you know, stop and think about it. So most of us work from home. We have a VPN connection. Okay, and so in theory, we should be using our Cedars issued laptop, but some of us will use our home computer as well. And so then you've got, you set up your VPN connection on your home computer, which may or may not have antivirus software. It may be infected by malware. And suddenly you've got this back door right past the firewall into the internal network. And so fortunately, we have some smart people who figure out how to, uh, to help us guard against that. <clears throat> um, number four, unencrypted PHI on a USB drive or cloud storage or personally owned computer. So, you know, um, talk about the fines that have been issued for people who have lost USB drives with thousands of patient records on them. Uh, recently, I think about a year ago, uh, I, forget, I think a hospital in New York was fined because uh, one of the residents was putting patient schedules on a Dropbox account that wasn't, proper, that wasn't secured. Well, number one, it wasn't secured. Two, it wasn't encrypted. And so uh, they got fined for that. Three, poor user access management. So I alluded to this earlier. So we've got employees. We have a pretty good handle on employees. They onboard them, offboard them, kill their accounts when they leave, things like that. Uh, we've got medical students who come in two weeks, gone, come in again. So there's a different governance and structure for them. And so they don't always tell us when people are leaving. So the people who manage the medical students don't always tell us when they're leaving. Volunteers, the volunteer office, they manage their own volunteers. And so we finally got them to let us know when the volunteers are, are, are leaving the program so we can kill their accounts. Um, <clears throat> visiting scientists come in for two weeks. They need an account. We don't necessarily know when they're gone. And then the, the, probably the hardest nut to crack are the physician, private physician offices. Now, at Cedars, we have about 10,000 people in the workforce. About 2,300 are physicians of the 2,300 only 300 are Cedars employees. The rest are private physicians. So those 200 private physicians are basically in business for themselves. They have their own laptops, their own desktops, their own cell phones, and they have office staff who work for them. And some of those office staff need to get into our system so they can do the scheduling and billing for that doctor. So we give those people accounts, but then generally we don't find out that the, the Susie, the billing clerk, has left until our help desk is called and says, hi, uh, I'm Amanda and I'm taking over for Susie and I forgot her password. So that's a red flag that goes up and then we say, oh shoot, you know, we need to kill Susie's account and set up a new one for Amanda. So that's one of the, that's one of the things that, that, that's a, a challenge right now that keeps me awake. Uh, number two on the list, a, su a successful phishing attack. That's how we got on the uh, spamrankings.net list. And uh, we still, from time to time, have people who fall for those phishing attacks. And generally, what happens is that we notice that their outbound mail message queue has just suddenly just gotten a tremendous increase in volume. And that's our indication that somebody's been had. So then we kill, the, we, you know, we kill their account right away, send somebody out to clean their machine, kill all the spam messages. So we're fortunately catching, nipping that in the bud when it happens so we, we can stay off the list. And then the number one thing is this is more of a privacy issue than it is a uh, security issue, but it's, uh, it's curiosity. So I don't know, those of you who read the LA Times about six months ago, we fired six people, or six people lost their jobs at Cedars because they heard a celebrity was, was there, and they just couldn't resist looking to see, to look up information. We caught them out the door. And, you know, and we thought we would use what the, our equivalent of a public hanging for that. So we basically published that in our employee newsletter. We didn't put in names or anything like that, but in, in the employee newsletter, notice everybody, you know, six people were terminated for accessing patient information inappropriately. So we thought, okay, that's our equivalent of a public hanging. Well, unfortunately, I think last week we uncovered three more people who 
were looking at something because they were curious. They'd heard about it in the news and they decided they wanted to take a look. So those are former employees. And when we interviewed one of them, they said, yeah, we knew we weren't supposed to do it. We saw the training, but you know, I just couldn't help myself. I just had to do it. So then um, our terms are vendors, uh, and I guess what other people would call the supply chain. Uh, you know, we call them business associates. So before we implement something, we do a, a risk assessment, have fill out this long form that basically says, okay, you know, you want to do business with us? Tell us how you manage security and things like that. And so one of the, it's proved useful because I think the first time we use this form, our marketing folks were looking to outsource the uh, physician referral program. And so they were talking to a company and then in this part of this, doing this assessment, it came out that this part, this company we we're dealing with was actually going to outsource the storage and maintenance of the database to a company in India. So that raised all sorts of red flags and that killed the deal. And then we've got a change control board that uh, once we get the, the thing in place, we've got a change control board and we review changes. And then when, when we have vendors who come in, we, they have to do a maintenance over a VPN connection or something like that. We make sure that when they come in, they only get to that IP address and the port for their application, nothing else. Uh, do a lot of security scanning on the post implementation. And the thing that we're, we're playing around with and we, we like the results is that we'll go back, we did it once and we're hoping to repeat it again, is we'll go back to our key business associates and just basically audit them to make sure that what they stated in the initial risk assessment is still valid. So the last part of this is our patient access portals. And <clears throat> that's, so we've got, we start off with minimal security, so make sure you have a secure website. So there it's basically a one-way flow of information. You're looking at parking maps, physician referral, marketing PR stuff, frequently asked questions, things like that. And so there you just worry about keeping your site secure from being defaced, maybe present, present, preventing against a DDoS attack. Then we've got the move on to the next step where now you have statements and bill pay through, through a website, a web portal. So there we depend on our vendors for the collections vendor for security. We sort of route the link to them and they have to worry about it. But now in the, the, the era of the EMR, We've got personal health records and where you can, patients can go and schedule visits, look up labs, do medical history, refill prescriptions, so on. So that at that point, we need financial grade security. So um, let me back up for this for a second. So on this financial grade security, um, it's uh, right now, you know, I think we can do a lot more because uh, right now all we're re re requiring are username and log on. And so that's, you know, that's not secure, but then it also raises some other questions. Well, okay, in my mind, it'd be great if we had multi-factor, two-factor authentication, the token. But then I think back to my neighbor who is about 85 years old, forwards to me every joke about in, in the world that he thinks is funny, all these links about cats on the internet, on YouTube videos, things like that. And for him, it's easy to tell when his email gets infected because you get this barrage of spam from him. And then he shuts down his email account and then three later he says, okay, well, I changed my password, I'm okay again. So I'm thinking, okay, so if I issue, implement anything and using him as a, as a metric, it's gotta be something that's easy enough for, for, for my neighbor to use and not have to worry about, geez, I pull out this token, I have to type in this number and I've got 30 seconds to type in the token and I have to get a new one, that's just not gonna scale. So we have to do something there. So it's just to close up, uh, what are things that we can do to increase our security? Well, I think what, number one on my list is putting pressure on medical device and application vendors to prioritize security. That FDA certification excuse is wearing really thin. Uh, we need better workforce education and we need cultural changes similar to that patient safety efforts. I can't walk 20 feet in, at Cedars without running into a patient safety sign. There's a sign about, on the elevator, there's a sign, big signs that say, wash your hands. You can prevent patient, you know, you can improve patient safety by washing your hands. Watch out for falls. Check, double check the medications, you know, things like that. And so basically, you know, over the years, this culture of patient 
safety and, and uh, patient care has just evolved to a point where it's, it's a cultural change. You can't, you know, it's, it's pervasive. And we need to make information security, raise it up to the same level. It has to become a patient quality of care issue, not just a security issue. Um, saying no doesn't work anymore. People will come up with a way to bypass you. So you have to work with the requesters, figure out what they need, and help and work with them. You have to be agile. My favorite story about this is that uh, our, one of the research folks came to me, and this is when four gigabyte drives were like you know, $300, remember those days? Now you can get them for about, what, $140? But um, anyways, they said, you know, Spencer, we've got 20 gigabytes worth of proteomics data we need to get to this lab in New York. It's kind of confidential, so we want to make sure it's shipped securely. I said, okay, fine. We'll think about a solution for you because, you know, we can't send it over the internet. It'll be too slow. So in the week that it took him to ask me and for me to get back to him with a solution, he said, oh, we took care of it. And, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that. This was also when you had to go, come to IT to get permission to buy a USB drive, right? So he said, oh, yeah, we figured out a way around it. Went to the Apple store, bought a 20-gig iPod, loaded the data on it, FedEx box, it's gone. So you have to be, be agile and, and work with them. So then the last thing is you have to start thinking about your patient-facing patient applications. So, you know, it has to be as secure as online banking. And as one of the talks earlier said, you know, we have to start thinking beyond protecting our perimeter. So, you know, here's a scenario that I've asked. So we have the technology to detect when a patient, when, when a password has been compromised and been used inappropriately. We can figure out that uh, pretty easily that an IP address that's being able to log into a site is, matches the address of a patient or something like that. So what do we do if we see that that IP address is being used from Los Angeles where the patient lives, and then 30 minutes later, that address is being used in France? Hello, there's a problem, right? So we say, okay, we can call the patient up and say, hey, you need to change your password. They change their password, it happens next week again. What do we do there? We change their password again, or do we have to take it to the next step and say, hey, you need to look at your machine and clean off the malware? Then, of course, that's going to lead to the question, well, can you help me clean off my malware? So, you know, those are questions that we have to, have to come up with, and we haven't really, figured out how, we haven't really thought, thought through those scenarios yet. So, um, you know, that's the last thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, when I was asked to do the uh, CSO gig, I had no idea what, what I was getting myself into. And had I, and, you know, getting, going after a CSO job was the furthest thing, uh, not in my wildest dreams would I imagine I'd end up as a CSO. But um, now that I've been doing it for a few years, I find it's kind of fun. And I'm also finding I'm doing some real work, too. So thank you. We have a few minutes to um, field any questions or pose any questions for Dr. Suhu. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll be glad to hand you this mic so he can hear you. All right, very good. Well, Dr. Suhu, on behalf of the um, Step down here. On behalf of the uh, Los Angeles chapter of the ISSA and the um, Southern California chapter of HIMSS, I want to thank you for being our keynote speaker, our lunch keynote speaker today, and appreciate your time and effort and your insight into this uh, topic. Thank you very thank much. You.